Upholding the rights of terrorists, Norway challenges a court ruling that its treatment of Anders Bering Breivik was inhumane. Also on today's program, deserting dreams, why record numbers of refugees in Germany are going back to where they came from. And in picture this, Europe freezes over as heavy snow blankets much of the continent, bringing life to a standstill. I'm Imran Garda, and this is The Newsmakers. How well should you treat a mass murderer? That's the question being debated right now in Norway. After being jailed for taking the lives of 77 people, Anders Bering Breivik claimed the state was violating his human rights. A court agreed, saying the prison conditions of the country's worst killer were degrading. But do microwaved meals, cold coffee and three private prison cells really constitute inhumane treatment? Brevik's fellow inmates reportedly want him out of solitary confinement because they feel it's unfair he has so much space to himself. Norway's prisons are generally considered to be among the world's most compassionate. But the judge said Brevik was subject to unjustified strip searches and isolation. And that goes against a democratic society's fundamental values. Today's newsmaker is Anders Bering Brevik, as we ask if Norway is violating his rights or whether his treatment is justified. Anders Bering Breivik is back in court. The far-right terrorist responsible for Norway's worst peacetime atrocity is facing an appeal against the ruling that his treatment in prison is inhumane. In July 2011, Breivik killed 77 people, detonating a car bomb in Oslo and carrying out a shooting spree at a summer camp for Labour Party youth. Breivik said Europe was experiencing a Muslim invasion and his attack was meant to be a wake-up call. He said it was necessary to start a war here in Europe and uh, throughout the Western world. So he's sorry that it was necessary, but it was necessary, he says. He is serving a 21-year sentence in what is considered one of the most humane prison systems in the world. But last year, he successfully sued the Norwegian government, saying the conditions he's held in violate the European Convention on Human Rights. Breivik's main challenge was regarding his solitary confinement. He was kept in his cell for 22 or 23 hours a day, denied contact with other inmates, and only communicated with prison staff through a thick glass barrier. He said this was affecting his mental health. Breivik also said he was subject to extensive use of handcuffs and strip searches, and the presence of female guards for these was upsetting for him. The judge ruled Breivik's prison regime was so different to any other prisoner in Norway, it had to be considered extra punishment. And that humane treatment is fundamental in a democratic society and must also apply to terrorists and killers. Breivik is Norway's most notorious and potentially most dangerous prisoner. His crime traumatised and directly affected much of the nation. Is the state violating Breivik's human rights or is it within its rights for ensuring that the punishment and security measures fit the crime? Yvette McCullough, The Newsmakers. Well, I'm joined now from the Norwegian capital by journalist Valeria Krishona, who's been covering Breivik's case for years. Thanks so much for joining us, uh, Valeria. Uh, Breivik used the opportunity once again to perform his Nazi salute. Are you surprised by that? No, it, I'm not actually. It was widely suspected that he would. And um, he does this uh, and uses the court uh, mainly for propaganda purposes. So it was not so unexpected. When the court had previously ruled that he had suffered inhumane and degrading treatment, did you believe that was the case? I think all of us were taken by surprise. It was widely expected 
uh, that he wouldn't win through in this case, uh, especially when you heard parts of his testimony and his complaints over cold coffee and the famous repeated TV dinners. But in effect, uh, the case, um, the courts did rule in his favor over Article 3 inhumane treatment because of the repeated use of isolation. And basically, they found that it was not warranted. They did not weigh the risks associated with his incarceration with the measures used. Yeah, now, when, when I was reading about this, I was thinking, okay, this is not a straitjacket. This is not him being waterboarded multiple times a day and so on, right? He had a, a three-room... Uh, prison cell, he had PlayStation, newspapers, magazines. Uh, you know, you could make jokes mm. about that being sort of a, a man's dream sometimes, right, uh, with isolation. Having said all of that, is it maybe just that I don't get the justice system in Norway, that the whole point of the justice system in Norway is a compassionate one that's supposed to reform you and that if you're going to keep somebody in isolation, that's not going to reform them, even if they killed 77 innocent people? Well, you're exactly right that Norway does base its correctional system on rehabilitation, even if you're a terrorist. And part of the court's ruling last year uh, in the initial civil uh, court case was that you cannot use it as an added form of punishment. Norway does not have the death penalty, it does not have a life sentence, so theoretically everyone has the right to rehabilitation. He's been granted permission to have university studies uh, from his cell. Um, so. It is based on rehabilitation. Uh, that said, he did document uh, hundreds of uh, strip searches and use of handcuffs um, that the prison said was warranted because of the risks involved. Uh, so that was the basis for the court's decision last year in ruling um, that Article 3 was violated in his case. Now, he also plans to appeal separately uh, after the Oslo court reportedly dismissed his complaints against the state of invading his privacy, right? So I'm, I'm looking mm -hmm. at that and the fact that, you know, his, his letters and so on will not be, uh, they were intercepted, right? And they won't be made public and so on. Is that a, is that a clue that maybe he's going to try and game the system in, in whatever way he can? Yes, that's what the Attorney General is arguing today, in fact, about that. A lot of the correspondent he has sent now are new friends, new mm. political friends, that he wishes to spread his political message. Uh, if you recall, shortly after the attacks, he released a political manifesto on the Internet where he said he would use his prison time as a method in spreading his message. So he's not hidden um, anything about what he would do once he's in prison. Uh, and the Attorney General is saying that these are not pen pals. These are political uh, right-wing extremists who want to carry out or push forward his message from prison. Hmm. This man is really fascinating. Now, I'm looking at his sentence and the fact that he will be released when he's 54 years old. Whether the state wins mm. or loses here, um, it is quite clear. I mean, we, we go back to the beginning. He did the Nazi salute, right? So there's propaganda value yeah. uh, for the guy. Looking at these latest images of him, he seems to have lost a bit of weight. He's shaved his head. He's, he's grown a bit of a, a beard. Do you fear and I don't know if, if this is a common fear in Norway, that this guy is going to constantly try to, to put himself in the news so that he can continue that momentum until he's 54 years old when he's released. Yeah, no, it's uh, undoubtedly his attorney has even said that regardless of what happens even in today's case, that they will appeal it further. They can take it to the Supreme Court for another round, and they can even further take it to Strasbourg to the European Court of Human Rights. And so every time he gets that courtroom um, uh, time to talk, uh, this court case is going to last almost a full week. He's going to have the opportunity to say and bring forth his message. Do you believe, Valeria, that he's a manipulative psychopath? I believe the first part. I believe he's using the court system. Paradoxically, um, he had denied the, the legitimacy of the court in his original criminal court case uh, when he didn't recognize the judge and said that he doesn't recognize it. Now he's actually using it for his own benefit. And he's actually uh, said that he wants to get headlines out of this. So, yes, it's, it's quite calculated. When you hear Amnesty International say it should be obvious that human rights laws apply to everyone, irrespective of how atrocious their crimes 
have been. That was Yuval Ginbar from Amnesty International. When you, when you hear that, does it sound as if Amnesty International is kind of tone deaf to this case, or do you agree with them? No, I mean, I think that they are stating the fact that everyone, regardless of what they've done, is entitled to human rights. I think what the Attorney General here is saying in this week's court case is that the threshold has been set far too low. Uh, how do you define what's inhumane and what's just basically uncomfortable prison sentence? Uh, prison is not meant to be uh, so comfortable uh, as the, uh, the state argued in the first case. So I think they're correct in what they're stating. Uh, and now it's just to see how low can you set that threshold for prisoners. Is he going to be able to rally a, a large support base um, as, as this thing rolls along? And as you say, if they appeal and they go to the Supreme Court and so on, is he going to become an even bigger hero to some? Well, I think that it goes in waves. I mean, there's always more momentum when it comes, and there's a lot of fuss for a week. But really, it, it gets forgotten, at least in the Norwegian media, and, uh, and, and it seems like it's forgotten f until the next court case. As to what uh, effect he's having on nationalists and political agendas elsewhere in Europe, there are so many others that are pursuing similar causes uh, of nationalism. It can almost wonder if it's just getting lost amongst the other messages. Mm. Something that I struggled to find in the English language media was um, statements from, say, families of, of, of victims. You had 77 innocent people, a lot of them just, just kids, teenagers, right? Uh, so we heard from the lawyers, yeah. we heard from the government, we heard from Amnesty International and so on. Journalists like yourself who've covered this story. Um, I wonder, in, in the Norwegian press, are we hearing from the, the families or of victims? What do they have to say? No, actually, surprisingly, there's very little being said. And I think it's because this is the third round and uh, people have gotten a bit of war weary, if you will. Uh, but it's understood that the victim's families obviously don't like any attention that he gets. Um, this case is being held out in Sheehan prison in a gym. Uh, so I think they like the fact that the, uh, the case is not being held in Oslo where it would gain widespread attention. So I think that they're just going to kind of ride out this week. Uh, but you don't see people coming out again saying he shouldn't have this or he shouldn't have that. I think they trust that the correctional system and the judicial system will just do what's right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's what I was, I was going to ask. Is there still fundamental trust in the system, in the Norwegian legal system, by Norwegians? There is. There is. And no one is crying for the death penalty or, you know, added sentences. You can't compound sentences in Norway, for example. You can't get 150 years. But there is this belief that Breivik will never get out. Uh, but technically, his sentence is 21 years plus rollover periods. Uh, so in theory, he could come out. But everyone seems to just believe it is a life sentence um, and that they'll never hear from him again, when in fact we hear from him now on a yearly basis through these court proceedings. Valeria Krishona, so good to get your thoughts. Thanks so much for joining us. Germany has been considered one of the most welcoming European nations amidst the region's worst refugee crisis since World War II. As other countries close their borders, blocking out people fleeing violence and poverty, Berlin opened them letting in hundreds of thousands of people over the past two years. But open arms have not always translated into better days for the refugees that have made it to their new homes. Thousands have since left in what officials consider the largest exodus of asylum seekers in the past decade. Natalie Pahernan explains. I fled to Germany to build my future but I realized I can't build it on fake promises. It's an unexpected reality for many refugees. Spending months in a new home, yet still jobless, culturally isolated, and separated from family. In 2015, almost a million refugees came to Germany seeking a better life. But now some of them are voluntarily going back to where they came from. About 55,000 refugees left the country in 2016. That's the largest number in more than a decade.
In 2015, Germany became the poster child for European hospitality, welcoming hundreds of thousands of refugees, most of them from Syria. Now I am telling you that if a big continent like Europe, with 500 million inhabitants, can temporarily give refuge to one million Syrians, I don't think that's asking too much as a neighboring region. I love America. I love you, I love you, America. But last year, anti refugee sentiment was on the rise. With far right protesters demonstrating against the open door policy. And Angela Merkel and her party, the Christian Democratic Union, have come under increasing pressure over what some critics labelled migrant mayhem. In 2016, Germany deported about 24,000 people after their asylum requests were rejected. But that's still less than half of the number of people who chose to leave by themselves. When diese freiwillig das Land verlassen, it's always preferable when people leave the country voluntarily instead of being deported. Deportation is always only the last resort to return asylum seekers to their home country. And that begs the question, why are they heading back home? Could they have woken from the European dream and decided it's just not worth it? Natalie Pohonen, The Newsmakers. Okay, to discuss this, I'm joined now by Karl Kopp from Frankfurt. He's the Director of European, European Affairs at Pro Asyl, an organization that works to protect refugees. He's also a board member of the European Council of Refugees and Exiles. Karl, good to have you on the program once again. So, 55,000 migrants and refugees left Germany voluntarily in 2016. Why? Yeah, indeed. Uh, it's uh, the highest number uh, of the last decade. Uh, most of them are from Western Balkan countries. They had no chance to get a status in Germany. It was a quite hostile environment for them. And then they said it's better to organize my return. Otherwise, they would deport him, so or her. Therefore, we have a quite high number based on frustration, mm -hmm. and more than 20,000 people were deported. So they were brought back by force. Yeah. So we look at, we look at some of the nationalities. We have Albanians, Serbs, uh, Kosovars, uh, and others. So is that maybe because the focus is on Syrians and, say, people from Afghanistan and Iraq, that they feel they're not going to get the kind of attention they need and they don't have a strong likelihood of, of getting their asylum papers accepted. You're right, uh, but it's quite clear uh, during an asylum in procedure, a fair asylum procedure, we have to assess uh, the story of the asylum seeker. So it's even a member of a minority could be politically persecuted and uh, get a status. but. The German society and the German politicians um, are quite uh, hostile, or let's say the German politicians decided to, to qualify these Western Balkan countries as so-called safe countries of a region. And therefore, it's quite difficult for the people to get a fair and decent asylum procedure. Therefore, we have very low recognition rates and high deportation rates. Carl, you get a few thousand dollars if you choose to leave, between three and four and a half thousand dollars, um, looking at the statistics, depending on how big your family is. That's surely quite a big incentive. It's some decent money, isn't it? It's an incentive. But on the other hand, it, it, it's wise to, to, to support people that they, they can build up a new life in their home countries. And it's also wise to offer them other options to migrate also to Germany to get access to the German labor market. Most of these countries are candidate countries of the EU, so we should give these people, especially the young people of this region, a fair chance to get access to our labor market, to our universities, and treat them in a decent and fair way. But what you're saying is against the grain, because it seems to be the case 
that many Germans, perhaps the majority, disagree with you. Why do they disagree with you? OK, <laughs> this is a very difficult question. Still, it's like this, that the majority of Germans are in favor of refugee reception. So quite op it's still a quite open-minded environment concerning the civil society. But it's quite clear if we have an ongoing negative debate, sometimes a quite populist debate, against certain groups of refugees, for example, Roma minority, this uh, fuels sentiments, resentiments, and uh, this uh, also creates uh, yeah, a, a negative view. And uh, therefore, maybe my view is a little bit a minority approach. But OK, I work mm -hmm. in a human rights organization. My job is that these people, everybody gets a fair asylum procedure and not based on prejudice. Mm -hmm. and in addition to those from, from the Balkan countries, you also have many Iraqis going back to Iraq. And that's fascinating, because Iraq is hardly a very safe country right now. Carl, if I had to interview you at the beginning of 2016, and I had to tell you, Carl Kopp, that 55,000 people, migrants and refugees, will, would leave Germany in the year 2016, would you have agreed with me that that would mean that Chancellor Angela Merkel's policies have failed? Merkel's policy has failed, but uh, maybe not because of this. Uh, so let's say the amazing aspect was uh, September 2000. Uh, 2015, yeah, to 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 open the borders, uh, to 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 receive the trapped refugees from Hungary, yeah, uh, via uh, Austria to create an legal or let's say in balanced organized way to open this Balkan route. This was from the human rights perspective, con based on human dignity, a uh, positive gesture. But later, how the German government and uh, the German authority managed the reception of these new arrivals, uh, there were fa uh, failures. And now, after Cologne, after the Berlin attack, uh, the whole uh, policy of, let's say, more open-minded approach is stopped. We have now uh, a priority deportation, send people back, block them at the border, create new camps, create new detention facility, and so on. So now Merkel is more in line with the coalition of the unwilling in Europe. That's a key problem. Europe, Europe as a whole, the EU, created a mess during this so-called refugee crisis. It was never a refugee crisis in Europe. It's a refugee crisis outside Europe in Turkey and in the, the key countries of refugee reception. But the European Union was not able to cope together in, in a spirit of solidarity and humanity. And therefore, the, let's say the last candidates who were in favor of these European value, values, like Germany, Sweden, and others, get more and more hostile and more and more restrictive. Mm -hmm. The victims of this policy are refugees. Right. Carl, always great to hear your perspective. Thanks so much for coming on the Newsmakers. Hope to have you on the program again. Thank you. All the best for you. Bye-bye. In today's picture, this heavy snowfall has swept across Europe blanketing much of the continent in wintry white. Let's take a look.
You've been watching this edition of the Newsmakers with me, Imran Gabda. Next time, we examine the legacy of former Iranian President Akbar Hashimi Rafsanjani and ask where Iran is headed. Until then, thanks for watching. Bye-bye.